I've had about eight psychiatrists and seven different doctors. I've told them all, like, you know. Oliver's most recent psychiatrist is Simon Fleminger. Fleminger agrees with Ramachandran's anatomical explanation of Capgra, but also feels that the condition may be coloured by the patient's emotional state. But it was just some, somehow you knew uh, that she was an imposter and wasn't your wife and wasn't to be trusted. Yes, that's right. Yes. One has to be able to incorporate into any model some idea that psychological factors can make the condition wax and wane. And I think one of the fascinations about the condition is how you bring that in, not to displace uh, a physical explanation, but to add to it. What I have tried to incorporate is the way in which what we're expecting to see can affect what we actually see. And if the apparatus that is related to memory function and to perceptions has in some way been damaged by brain injury. And if your expectations are sufficiently strong and powerful, as they might be in somebody who is very, very frightened or suspicious, then in fact what you see is more determined by what you expect to see than what is really going on out there. This is perhaps what's happening in people with Capgra. They get the belief that their wife is not to be trusted. And that then affects how they see their wife, and the result is that they're perceiving somebody who isn't their wife, who must therefore be an imposter. Luckily for Capgra patients, the condition seems to heal itself. Oliver's wife is no longer a vampire, and David no longer thinks his parents are imposters. The man who looks like his father is his father and triggers the flow of all the old familiar feelings. But sometimes the flow of feeling that completes the act of recognition becomes an uncontrollable flood. For John, this can make the experience of just looking at the world unbearably intense. John has temporal lobe epilepsy the seizures involve my person and my soul and my spirit, all of it. When I get one of those feelings, so my whole body just tingles and just, oh, I'm like, that's that. John's epilepsy raises the amazing possibility that the temporal lobes of the brain may play a part in the specially intense feelings that we call religious experience. John has temporal lobe epilepsy. The storms that rage through his brain raise the tantalizing prospect that we all might have a kind of God spot. A specialized structure hardwired into our brains that opens us to religious feelings. It has been known for a long time that some patients with seizures originating in the temporal lobes have intense religious auras, intense experience of God visiting them. Sometimes it's a personal God, sometimes it's a more diffuse feeling of being one with the cosmos. Everything seems suffused with meaning. The patient will say, finally, I see what it's all really about, doctor. I really understand God. I understand my place in the universe, in the cosmic scheme. Why does this happen? And why does it happen so often in patients with temporal lobe seizures? My attitude was I was God, and then I had heaven and hell in my eyes. That was it, you know what I mean? I was the, the grand guy who created heaven and hell. John's epileptic seizures are essentially an electrical storm in his temporal lobes, when a group of neurons start firing at random, out of sync with the rest of his brain.
Recently, John experienced one of his worst episodes to date. For nearly a week, he had eight seizures a day. Each seizure lasted about five minutes and involved violent convulsions that left him unconscious. I basically have made plans with an ex-girlfriend to go out to the Salt River in Arizona out in the desert. This girl likes to drink a lot. And to keep up with her, I uh, started drinking vodka martinis and I went into some serious seizures out there. Later that day, John somehow managed to get a call through to his father, who immediately drove out to the desert to bring him home. On the way home, him and I just got into some philosophical, you know, questions about everything, and I just would not shut up once I got on the way home. I was going and going. It was like I was wired. It's basically an earthquake within the body. And like any earthquake, there are aftershocks. Mainly what I deal with is the aftermath, particularly with this last episode. It was very much like stepping into a Salvador Dali painting. Okay, it, instantly everything was surreal. And that's, in essence, what his seizures are all about, the aftermath. Um, where it puts his brain, where it puts his memory, where it puts his mind, his thinking ability, everything else. When John eventually came through this last episode, he was exhausted, but he felt omnipotent. I went running down the street screaming that I was God. And then this guy came out, and I was just like pelvic thrust at him and his wife, and I was like, you want an effing bet? I ain't God. And I said, literally, you asshole, get back in here. What do you think you're doing? You made me. Come on Come back on, in. All right. Come on back all in right. right now. I'm Come going, on. I'm going. You know, you're disturbing the neighbors, you're going to call the cops. What is this all about? All right. All right, all right. You're all okay. Right. All right. You're not God. <laughs> I kind of just looked at him cool and calm and apologized to him, and I'm like, no, no one's going to call the police. Like, it, I didn't say this last part, but I'm thinking to myself, no one's going to call the police on God. John was introduced to Ramachandran by his doctor, who knew of Ramachandran's interest in disorders that straddled a boundary between neurology and psychiatry. John had had a recent seizure, which made their encounter very emotional. When I listen to certain types of music, I have this connection with another world, almost. And it's very hard to convey it to another person. Uh, yeah, if you were to ask my dad, he would just say, I am completely through the gateway and into a, another reality 100 percent indeed a separate physical reality is every bit as real to him mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. although it is absolutely nothing like this reality is to us i have looked in his eyes in those times and i have seen seen a cry for help I've been in so much pain that I'd rather be shot to death, dude, or just whipped to death. Mm -hmm. Whipped but also, to also death. joy? Yeah, I've Somewhere. been in so much joy that I would rather be left alone. Get, get, take everything away and just let me sit there and have that much joy. I feel like I can float and stuff sometimes, you know? Okay. okay. It's just, it's like... It's like the best. People, people just go, what are you talking? I've done, I've gone, done all kinds of drugs and things and been with, you know, women. And I just go, you don't understand, man. Very first seizure I can remember, he was 17 years old. Okay. So and until 17, he was kind of pretty much like any other kid. He went through the usual adolescent problem. Very much but, so, yeah. But otherwise, was your family, are you religious or is he religious at, before that time? Uh, not, uh, not, no. Now, why do these patients have intense religious experiences when they have these seizures? And why do they become preoccupied with theological and religious matters even in between seizures? 